Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajmain. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah welcome back to the recommencement of our kuliah zuhur uh, beginning this week insyaallah. So if you're free uh, please do give some time and you know uh, and gain some knowledge um, insyaallah after your zuhur prayers. Um, we begin by wanting to remind each other that, you know, this just about one month plus after the month of Ramadan, and I want to remind myself and including uh, the Jama'ah that, you know, all the ibadah that I perform in the month of Ramadan, try to instill, try to develop, try to sustain at least one or two of them. So otherwise, then the Ramadan that we've uh, embarked, the Quran that we've been reading, the tahajjud that we've been performing, you know, it should not be just restricted to the month of Ramadan. Right? So um, in this uh, new um, uh, month, we are going to begin our Wednesday Kulia with a new topic uh, entitled Ashara Mubashara, uh, which refers to the 10 of the companions who were promised paradise. And one of the main objectives why we want to study this is so that we can know who these people are and we can see why they have been promised paradise and inshallah, when some of their actions can inspire us and inshallah, we can also become candidate for Jannah. Inshallah, Amin, Ya Rabbal Alameen. Now, we want to begin this by mentioning a hadith narrated in Sunan al tirmizi where the Prophet wasallam mentioned, Abu Bakr will be in paradise, Umar will be in paradise, Uthman will be in paradise, Ali will be in paradise, Talha will be in paradise, Zubair will be in paradise, Abdurrahman bin Awf will be in paradise, Sa'ad bin, bin, bin Waqas will be in paradise, Sa'ad bin Zaid will be in paradise, and finally Abu Ubaidah bin Al Jarrah will also be in paradise. And this confirmation by the beloved Prophet is really, I think, probably the penultimate gift that any believer uh, can achieve. I mean, to be able to be validated, to be able to be given a sort of like a guarantee that what you've been doing in your life has been on the right path and your reward and your end will be this penultimate aim, Ya'ni Jannah, this is really a magnificent gift, mashallah. And then we also have many collections. If you collect them, then you come with these 10 uh, people that were named. Um, and in other hadith in Sahih Bukhari and Muslim and in Tirmizi as well, one day, Sana Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu an came and asked permission to see the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then the Prophet responded by saying, "Let him in and give him the glad tidings of Jannah." So confirm that thing. And of course, the companions when they hear this, so they also they also wondering, "Alamak, what about me?" And then Sana Umar also came in and Rasulullah, "Can I come in?" And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Let him in and give him the glad tidings of Jannah." And then Sayyidina Uthman also did the same thing. And again, the Prophet said, let him in and give him the glad tidings of Jannah because of an affliction that will befall him. And so in this uh, kulia, and I think it will bring us all the way until the end of the year in December, inshallah, we will look at a little bit of the history of these companions, what, what they went through and what are the things that they've done that, you know, that caused the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be on them and inshallah we can try to emulate. And we will see what does it mean by the affliction that's going to fall on Sayyidina Uthman. And so in a little bit, this is a very good historical uh, uh, lesson that we can take the opportunity from. Rather than studying just the four caliphs, uh, we can study the history of all these ten of these companions, inshallah. So um, let's look at the list, who they are. First and foremost is Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Um, he uh, passed on at the age of 63 and he was the first caliph in Islam. Uh, he was a caliph uh, two years, for two years. Um, and these were not easy years, these were very foundational years. If not for the stability and the steady hands of the caliph of Sayyidina Abu Bakr, then perhaps the position of the Muslims will be quite in chaos. He reminded them that if you worship Allah, he will be you know, forever, but if you worship uh, the Prophet, then the Prophet has died. And, you know, in that tumultuous situation where everybody was confused, for the first time they had to, you know, face a situation where, Alamak, the Prophet has died, you know, so they, they, you know, they were sad. So, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was the only one 
amongst the crowd that reminded them of that verse. We'll talk about this, inshallah, next week. The second would be Sina Umar al Khattab. Um, he died also at the age of around 63. He was the second caliph in Islam, and his caliphate uh, was about 10 years. And this is followed by Sina Uthman ibn Affan, an, who was the third caliph. Uh, we also talk a little bit, inshallah, um, how the transition between one caliph to another. And uh, Sina Uthman's period was also named at one point to be the golden age of Islam. The expansion of the Islamic empire, thank you, uh, was massive. It was like the, the, it was the biggest at that time. And he was running the caliphate for 12 years. And then, of course, uh, Sana Ali Karamallah Wajha, who then took over and was a caliph for about four years. And then we'll see a little bit of the, um, you know, it's been said by historians, the first fitna, right? Uh, what happened um, after that, uh, the handover from the period of the Ar Rashidin to the period of the Umayyad, uh, which was led by uh, Muawiyah. Okay, and then the other companions were Taha ibn Ubaida. Uh, he perished during the Battle of the Camel, and Zub uh, Taha and Zubair, both, they were really uh, quite good friends. They died at the same time. This was at a period when um, they were with Sayyidina Aisha. This is, could be said as a first civil war within Islam. Uh, if you are patient enough to go through with us, you will see what happened. Sayyidina Aisha declaring war against Sayyidina Ali. And so, but, you know, in the end when, uh, you know, this was all, all halted and they were, went back on their own ways and they made peace and then uh, they were murdered, uh, both Talha and Zubair. So, and then we see Abdul Rahman bin Auf, uh, who died of natural causes at the age of 72. Sa'ad bin Waqqas, also another prominent companion at the age of 73 of natural causes. Sa'ad bin Zaid age of 70, also natural causes, and finally, Abdullah Emil Jarrah, who perished slightly younger at age of 58 because of uh, a plague of a sickness. Yeah, so this is roughly um, the summary of the background of the 10 of these companions who were given the good news of Jannah. Now, so today we want to embark, begin with the story of Sina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, we are quite familiar with the four caliphs. Um, so, if you hold on, then we will talk about the other companions who are less known to most of us. And inshallah, we can derive some inspiration from them, inshallah. So, Sayyidina Abu Bakr was born 573 uh, AD in Mecca. He is two years younger than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, the Prophet died at the age of 63, and then he took over two years later, he died, same age. Best friends. Right, they're, they're, he's the best friend of the Prophet. He belonged to uh, of the Quraysh tribe of uh, Banu uh, Tamim. Um, this is something that is interesting and we need to know because he is our caliph. Uh, we only know him as Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr is his uh, sort of like pseudonym, nama Timang Timangan. His real name really is Abdullah. Right? His father's name is Umar, uh, Uthman, not Sena Uthman, uh, um, another guy called Uthman, but known as Abu Kahafa. Mother's name is Salma, known as Mulkhair, the mother of the good one. That means Sena Abu Bakr is the good one. Right? So really, Sana Abu Bakr, his real name is Abdullah bin Uthman. So that's the real name. Okay? And as you probably know, the Arabic culture at that time, they like to give nama nama timbangan, for example. So the Prophet Wasallam is not known as Muhammad. He's known as Al-Amin, for example, because of his characteristic. And it's not one person giving the name uh, at that time. Like, misalan, example, you like this person, you say, oh, he's a good guy. But not everybody agrees with you. At that time, you cannot call him the good guy. It must be agreed by the community. By the oh, yeah, he's Al-Amin. Okay, we agree. Whether you like him or not, but you cannot dispute the fact that his characteristic is the truthful one. Right? So, um, after embracing Islam, uh, we will talk about this maybe today or next week, inshallah. He is given the title of as a really an honorable title. A Siddiq, it can be translated as the truthful one or the truth verifier. And this came from the incident of Isra al Mi'raj after that, when Abu Jahal talks about the Prophet and he said, you know, have you heard about your friend? He did not know anything about Isra Mi'raj at first because if you remember, the Prophet ﷺ wanted to inform his family first. And then on the way back, uh, he was going to meet the Prophet and then he saw Abu Jahal and said, you know, your crazy friend, he said this, 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 this. He came back within one night, he saw these things. And without verifying, without knowing this, he said, if the Prophet said this, then it must be true. So we see, for example, I mean, we have many friends. <laughs> and we have many colleagues at work. And we are a father, maybe, or whatever. So is our characteristic, characteristic is such that to our best friend, we trust him or her so much that whatever he says goes. 
And this is why they were best friends. So inshallah, as we go on, we look at what it takes to be a good friend, to be a best friend, to be an honorable person, so that we, you know, sometimes when I look at history and I ask myself, if Sayyidina Abu Bakr was given a siddiq, and the Prophet was asked, uh, was, was in, you know, he said before, you know, uh, every Prophet has two wazir, has two advisors, has two in common parlance who say BFF. The spiritual BFF of the Prophet is Malaikat Jibreel and Malaikat Mikael. The physical, the, the world, worldly best friends, advisors, wazir he has, uh, Sana Abu Bakr and Sana Umar, right? Allah Right? So, and then I ask myself, like, do I have an Abu Bakr and Omar in my life? Okay, forget about Jibay and Mekai. Itu kita tak ada lah kan? Kita bukan prophet. So, in my life, do I have an Abu Bakr and Omar? Right? And then to ask the question, we need to backtrack again in order for me to actually be given the privilege of having someone who loves me and trusts me enough like Abu Bakr and Omar, am I an Abu Bakr and Omar to someone else? And then because of that, then you begin to improve your character, improve uh, the quality of your relationship and your friendship so that if you can become an Abu Bakr to someone else, you will have your Abu Bakr, inshallah. Because in life, we cannot travel alone. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes, for example, eh, nak semang tahajud. Uh, okay, I'm tired. Then if I say, eh, come on, let's do it. Lah. Let's come to Afala, for example, once a month. Let's do this together, Kiamulaya, example. Eh, come for kuliah, lah, you know, maybe 20 minutes only. By 2 o'clock, he's done. Then we can come back to the office. Someone to push us. Because while we can do this, sometimes we need a little bit of push because we're human beings. Right? So, inshallah. So, this is the characteristic of as -Siddiq. Without knowing, having, before he heard the story of the prophets Isra and Mi'raj, he said, if he said that, it must be true. I mean, I asked myself also, let's say my friend, he said, hey, by the way, yeah, yesterday I went from, example, uh, Singapore to, I don't know, uh, to New Zealand. <laughs> and then New Zealand, I went upstairs, and then I come back within one, two hours. You percaya tak? You probably say, kau dah gila eh? <laughs> you, you okay not? Maybe you sembahyang banyak sangat ke apa ke, whatever lah, you know. And what if your friend, another friend say, hey, you know your friend, that one, he said he went to New Zealand and come back within two hours. What would you say? I said, okay, he must be crazy. This is the difference between Abu Bakr and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Of course, the difference is, of course, that's the Prophet lah, different. Nah, ini kita punya friend memang kita ada sikit plus minus. Ini the Prophet, confirm 100%. But I mean the idea in itself. Okay, so that's his parentage. Now, he is the first man who embraced Islam after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told him about Islam in secret. The first, uh, the first woman is Sayyidina Khadija radiallahu anha, and the first youth is his cousin, Yani Sayyidina Ali karamallahu wajha. So these were the first Muslims. Uh, when the Prophet received revelation, when the Prophet told them about this, they accepted, they embraced. But of all of them, Sana Abu Bakar was a little bit more, no, not a little bit, a lot more special than normal. Because, well, he was the friend of the Prophet. And when they become BFF, that means there are certain characteristics of Sana Abu Bakar that the Prophet honors and finds, you know, uh, noble. And so that's why they become best friends. A best friend is someone whom you can trust. A best friend is someone who shares the same, you know, uh, uh, you know perspective about, about life. To someone who can push you when you're down. So this was the man of Abu Bakar. I mean, we see when um, after you know islam was declared and you find a lot of slaves have been you know tortured punished and even killed bilal for example was bring out in a in a you know in the middle of the desert and kalau kita complain ini panas desert ya allah subhanahu lagi panas not only panas wap panas pasir padang pasir so he was basically uh, stripped and then he put down on the floor and then spread white so his body is burning, then the, the weather is burning on him, you know, and it was a, a big stone rock was put on his body, and then he said, okay, uh, you know, uh, renounce Allah. But he didn't, you know, until he was about to die. And he said, ahad, and like, to say the shahada was so difficult, ahad, ahad, ahad means one, ahad, ahad. You know, he didn't give up. And you and I have never in our life, I think, generally, guessing, lah, I haven't, been tested so much that someone, you know, put, threatened my life and said, okay, give up Allah. And I'm not sure what is my choice. I'm not sure whether I would just, I'd rather die than give up my faith. Unless we've been tested, we can know for sure. 
and then Sayyidina Abu Bakr, with all his wealth, he was one of the wealthiest men in Mecca, going all around, randomly bringing his wealth on his camel, walking, I mean, riding on his camel. Oh, once they've tortured because he's a Muslim, I'll buy his freedom. Then he go again, I'll buy his freedom. This is what it means to be a trustee of Allah's wealth in this world. Not to keep on piling and piling and piling, because if you go down the grave, pun tak boleh bawa all this money. And then the, the problem is, you'll be burdened by who is going to get my Mercedes, who's going to get my condo, who's going to get my this, and then anak-anak kita semua gaduh. You know? So he was from the richest until he had nothing. In one of the battles, he said, Ya Rasulullah, to sustain this battle, I'm going to give all my property to Islam. And, you know, and, and that's why he is one of the ten promised paradise. So, when the Prophet discussed to him, and there's a beauty about Sunnah um, al about Allah's revelation, and he said, you know, we must uh, denounce worshipping idol and so on and so forth and become a Muslim. He accepted it immediately without hesitation, without question, because he trusts in the person, yeah, I need the Prophet Sallallahu and he trusts in the message. It makes sense to him. It makes sense to him. And the Prophet Sallallahu said in this hadith, when I invited people towards Allah, everybody took some time and let me think about it. Maybe Salam called Orange Joy Insurance, you buy insurance from me lah. Okay, let me think about it. You know, let me think about it. At least for a while, the Prophet said, except Abu Bakr, who accepted my call, the moment I put it before him, and he did not hesitate even for a moment. He did not hesitate even for a moment. And this is the kind of friends that we need to be, and these are the kind of friends that we need to surround ourselves with. Someone who trusts us enough that they won't even question. That we therefore must be a person who's honest. Not jangan kelintong sana. Sometimes our like, joking can be, you know, can affect the, the characteristic. For example, we say, Eh, hey, I think Al-Fala today closed lah. Eh, hey, really ah? No lah, I'm just joking. Like, there's no intent, but if we clintong clintong regularly, people say, Eh, cannot be trusted lah. Every time, trick people. You know, that sort of thing. So it affects our character. It becomes our character. I mean, what's the, what is the objective of making, like, you know, worthless uh, lies or joke like that? It doesn't add anything to the value to the relationship. So this is a story of Sayyidina Umar Bakr radiallahu anhu who accepted without question. And then we see his da'wah. As soon as he embraced Islam, he started the work of da'wah. Through him, and this is one of the guarantee of Jannah, through him, prominent sahaba embraced Islam. He was out going like, you know, you know embrace Islam, you know, worship that one God, come back to your fitrah. This was what our forefathers were actually doing before we forgot and we went astray. Out of the ten promised paradise, six of them converted or became Muslims through his hands, through his da'wah. I mean, if six others going to paradise, the one who convert takkan tak masuk paradise. You, you understand this logic? Subhanallah. The importance of therefore da'wah. So, for example, who they were, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina uh, Talha, Sayyidina Azubais, Ibn Waqas, Abdul Ubaidah, Abdul Ra'uf, seven of them out of ten. And the three who wasn't through him was, of course, the other caliphs, Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali, Sayyidina Umar. So he was instrumental in this list. If seven of them because of him, surely there's a guarantee that he is definitely one of them, the leader among some of them. But things does not come easy. When you want to do the right thing, when I know sometimes I, know I've, I teach a lot of youth, teenagers, or you know, 20 something, and then say, so okay, I want to come back to the path, maybe not, not kawin balik, okay, what? I mean, getting married. So, you know, they start to learn about Islam. The first thing I tell them, look, the, the, uh, the faster you accept, you embrace this, the easier it be for you. Remember, <coughs> coming back, you will, it will not be a smooth one, it will be a challenge. The f uh, faster you embrace this, you understood this, then you're okay. <coughs> but if you think as an entitlement that I am someone who's going to come back to Allah and I want to start praying five times a day so Allah make it easy so don't put me any challenge, then you're going to be disillusioned. Then the first challenge that comes to you will be your friends. And sometimes they are your Muslim friends. Eh, kenapa ni nak semang-semang di masjid? Semang sini dah okay what? You know, kenapa nak kena halal haram? Tak apalah, bismillah ni, Allah understands. You know, that sort of thing. Eh, why, why want to wear hijab? You know, it's very hot. You know, it's just, it's got, you know, context lah, you know. Later lah, when you retire, you know, when you become grandmother, wear hijab. You know, that sort of thing. Why go hajj now? Later lah. 
when you get your CPF. Now you're not going to get your CPF. Just go when you can and ask yourself this question. If whenever you get bonus, you go to Paris, London, New York, but you don't go for Hajj. And then you die. And then Malakat, which Malakat? Malakat, Israel come, like, okay, uh, I'm going to take your life, pap. Then he said, eh, dah pergi, dah, dah shahada, the five uh, rukun Islam, eh? Dah shahada, dah, dah pray, sometimes, part-time, part-time. Ramadan, yes, once a month. Zakat, okay, Alhamdulillah. Dah pergi Hajj, belum. Then where else have you gone? Oh, I've gone to Paris, London, New York, Iceland, Mars, Jupiter, semua dah pergi. Hajj, belum. Why? How can you return to Allah when you have not perfected the five basic action that a Muslim must have? These are the five basic. You know, so sometimes, of course, we are encumbered by finance. Okay, but the first thing, trust me, I'm an Ustaz, I'm an ustaz. I don't earn as, as much as almost all of you, probably. But you must begin by putting in the right sincere intention. Ya Allah, I really want to perfect my deen. I really want to perform these five basic actions. I want to visit your house. And then every day, other day, your tahajjud or your Ramadan or Kamulal or any, any other day when you salat hajat, make that as one of your hajat. You know, it might happen. It has, I mean, for example, in my case, it has happened to me. I mean, some of you might know my story. Um, you know, after I graduated, I mean, I was working as a lawyer. I have enough money. Money is not a problem. Subhanallah. But I promised myself, don't be distracted. I made a vow. If I don't go for Hajj, I wouldn't go nowhere. JB pun I won't go. So, you know, it's usually friends, eh, pergi makan kukup ke, seafood ke, dizaru ke, whatever it is. I said, no, I tak suka. I just make any excuse. Because I know my vow with Allah is, if I have never, if I have not gone to your house, I don't want to go to any other houses. And subhanallah, every day you make tahajjud, you make tahajjud, and you make tahajjud, and... When Allah paves the way, you, you know, I, would, I tell you, you know, in the zaman dulu, now maybe a bit difficult. I decided to go for Hajj three weeks before the first group fly off. By the time I go to apply for visa, I say, hey, Ustaz, uh, everybody, you know, visa already closed. I say, never mind, never mind. I go and speak to the Saudi Embassy, subhanallah. Macam-macam challenge, subhanallah. Then after that, I got visa, last minute, the, the, you know, subhanallah. Then I want to give my passport, alamak, below six months, can I renew. And then the Saudi Embassy wants my passport. I say, alamak, I go to ICA. You know, usually ICA, you know, last time maybe one week, you come back. Ah, sekarang, two, three days. One week, I go there. Alhamdulillah, makci serve me. I mean, a Muslim lah, Muslim lah. And then I said, makci, after that, process, makcik, I, I need the, the, the passport lah. Nak gimana? Nak pergi haji. Huh? Last minute, orang nak pergi next week. You just apply for your passport. And I said, how fast can you process? And I said, okay. Then, mungkin dia tengok muka saya kesian. Okay, you duduk dulu. Then, masuk jumpa officer, gerbang gerbuk. They said, okay, come back, go for lunch, come back to our center, I give you. Subhanallah. Straight away, I go masjid, I sujud syukur. Then, that day itself, I give Wal hasil, by three days later, visa all done, approved, and then I go, subhanallah. Right? So, my point is this. You just need to start putting in your sincere intention, and Allah does the rest. Because when Allah decides that whatever He wants to do, although it seems impossible, it will be possible. I mean, logically, who can fly from Mecca to Batul Maqdis? I don't want to say, you know, Jerusalem because Jerusalem now the point is like somewhere politically that took out. So, Batul Maqdis, Batul Maqdis go up. Like, cheat, like, <laughs> how possible is that? Impossible. But when he wants to make possible, it will be possible. And no one can stop him. Subhanallah. And this is a story. So, he, Sayyidina Abu Bakar, and to, to wrap this before we end, because I want you to go back. <laughs> Alamak dah 2 o'clock. Yes. He did not, it's not easy for him. He faced challenges. The first khutbah, Look at what happened to him. Uh, he was beaten till his nose and ears were badly mauled, entire face besmeared with blood. He was kicked, trashed with shoes, trampled under the feet. But despite all this, dapping some pinsan, berdarah, muka dia semua, dah lebam-lebam. You know? And what did people say? What did he say after he gained consciousness? He did not talk about who did this, let me take revenge. You know, he didn't. He said, how was the Prophet? Subhanallah. This is the kind of love and relationship he has with the Prophet ﷺ. He is more concerned about the beloved than even himself. And hence, this is one of the aspects that will bring him into Jannah, inshallah. So I just want to stop this and inshallah, we, we will look at the learning points for this next week. And next week, we're going to talk about how he got his name of Asadiq. 
right? So um, you should go back to work. It's 2 o'clock. <laughs> we as a Muslim, we must be amana. If it's 2 o'clock, it's 2 o'clock. So let us uh, recite uh, Tasbih Kafarah and uh, answer insha'Allah. Uh, if you're free, come and join us again next week. We'll continue with this conversation, insha'Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdika ashadu ala ilaha ila anta. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilai. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim al-Asri inna al-insan ala fi khusar. Ila alladhina amanu wa aminu salihati wa tawasu bil haqqi wa tawasu bil sabur. Sadaqallahu azim. See you next week, insha'Allah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.